So, as we continue on the further adventures of my life, so I'm looking at this, you know, looking at uh, how these things go with the situation and everything. And then I try to figure out, you know, why are people so crazy? And uh, some of it, I think, stems from television and radio, right? Because TV, I don't know if y'all turn on the TV lately, TV is just crazy. Like, like the, the thing they try to convince you of is, is, is like bizarre. Like, you cannot find the love of your life out of 20 dudes in 10 episodes. It's just never going to happen. It has never happened in the history of the world or TV. You know what I mean? And then you got guys fighting, what is this, this I love New York, you're fighting for some girl that like Flavor Flav dumped twice, like has it come to this? They were fighting for Flavor Flav's rejects, has it come to this? So, I look at this thing here and, uh, and I see that, you know, this is how some people really look at it, like they equate love like this and they listen to like songs, like I was talking to this young lady that lives in uh, College Park and, and she was like, you know, I want a man like Babyface, like that song he had, that as soon as I get home song, he's gonna cook your dinner and pay your bills and run your bath as soon as he gets home, you know. And I'm like, Babyface, who wrote the song, ain't like that. He's divorced. <laughs> you know? I'm like, his wife is dating Eddie Murphy. Can you imagine what you had to do to a woman to make her date Eddie Murphy? <laughs> I'm like, it, it can't be that phenomenal. <laughs> you know? And then uh, this other girl, she says, you know, she watched the movie Love Jones. You know, I want a man like Lorenz Tate and Love Jones. I'm like, Lorenz Tate is not like Lorenz Tate. Lorenz Tate looks like six feet tall in the movies, five three in real life. I'm like, is this this is not how it works? Like television and, and the radio have people wishing for things that are just never gonna happen. So I wrote a poem about this thing sitting in my cube one day at work, and uh, I read a lot of poems at work. Y'all, I know a lot of y'all are students. Y'all, I, I haven't gotten to the right poems at work stage yet, but it's coming. So um, I sat there and wrote a poem about this whole thing about that and uh, my whole you know dating life. My girlfriend had like weird perceptions of like love too. And uh, it's called Never Fin to Be. You'll find a lot of my poems have like these real like, uh, I ride the number 15 down Candle Road a lot. So that's kind of my audience. So if the people on number 15 don't get it, that means I wrote it wrong. So this is um, Never Fin to Be. It ain't never fin to be where those chick flicks promise. It's so far away from Hollywood Boulevard, Richard Gere and Julia Roberts. So far away from Cruz and Day Mornay with nothing to lose and so they decide to run a brothel before running off to college. Or oh, Sanai and Omar Epps outside midnight in their sweats playing make them take them for a trip to the altar. What they don't tell you in the altar is that it may not end well. Hell, relationships are about as unpredictable as the model. I mean, they all start out all Hakuna Matata on some freaky stuff like Robin and Madonna. Huggy, huggy, kissy, kissy, call me later, do you miss me, lovey, dovey, and we wish we could stay this way forever. But relationships and the weather them both run hot and cold. And all good things in time have gotten old, gotten bitter. I know I've broken up, woken up, and gotten back with her. Just to find ourselves buying time over candles, wine, and dinner, because time has a way to help to remind and help you both remember why you broke up in the first place. And when you get back together, it's going to feel like a first date, but just wait. Because love is a whirlwind torrent. And when you come down off your love high, your old problem's going to be waiting like an outstanding warrant, because it ain't never fitting to be with them love songs promise. It ain't never finna be Lisa Lisa all cried out over you with boobs crammed in a tube top. Or you and Janet Jackson trying to wait a while on a Manhattan rooftop. Or you and Cheryl Pepsi Ryle thanking God for y'all child homie. It's more likely to be child support and alimony. Everybody in court acting all wild and phony. Funny, but when it comes to the money and dividing the marital assets, she got her Maybelline running in front of Judge Maybelline front and they hunting for your W-2s, credits, debts, and last check. Or he trying to deny y'all ever had sex. All on Maury trying to tell his story when everybody see and say that baby got his DNA. They don't even need a blood test, but for the viewing audience, they're going to take one anyway. <laughs> Television and music got people wishing for fairy tales, but I say the truth is just this. Love and life are going to be the real world sans the MTV, a flavor of love richer than anything you can see, smell, or taste. My great-grandparents were survivors, and true, they made their fair share of mistakes, but they made up, they made us, and that's what it's going to take. Some struggle, brother. A man that's not afraid to say I'm sorry, a woman who says, in spite of it all, I still love you, so... Love her, because ain't nobody perfect, but y'all can be perfect for each other. Once we all begin to understand, comprehend, and discover that it ain't never finna be like radio or TV, no, no Cosby's, no Cleavers, no curtains, no levers, no commercial breaks, no written jokes, no mirrors, no smoke, no, no remixes, no pixie dust, no stunt doubles. It's, it's just us watching Castaway. <laughs> As Miss Clara tells us how to wash our great past away, and we spend half the day just staring at each other, listening to Donnie Hathaway, trying to make one out of two. Because we're alone now. And I've been writing this poem for you. Thank you, good people. I'm going to write one more poem, then I'm going to go. And so, after looking at all this stuff, like people with TV and radio and all this madness they go through, I decided that, on a whole, 
what everybody should do is um is just shut up, you know, and like listen to each other, you know what I mean? That's like the problem with the world today. Like uh, actually, like before you leave here, you should probably at least try to meet like one person you don't know. Like like people just don't like interact like they used to. Like I was at Intermezzo. I don't know if you ever go to Cafe Intermezzo. It's like 50, 60 people sitting there, and nobody's talking to each other. Like everybody's on the cell phone talking to someone who's not in the room. <laughs> so I was like, you know, you never know. You know, your, your uh, 10 episode, 20 person love could be in here. You never know. You know, or your next financier, you know, next most interesting person you could ever meet sitting right in the room. You just never get that opportunity because you talk to somebody you already know on the phone, they probably can't afford. So I was thinking about this, and, uh, and I was actually did a poem for Doris Wells. She was the first African-American librarian of DeKalb County in her retirement ceremony. And uh, I wrote this poem. It's called The Librarian that I dedicate to her. And it's just about how things, you know, get to moving pretty fast. And a lot of people say a lot of things they don't mean. And sometimes everybody should just, just be quiet. So this right here is that right there. Then I'm going to go this way. And then Colin Kelly's going to come here and amaze you. And then we're going to tap dance out here. All right. It's what the librarian said when I was in grade school, beating on my chest, beating on the desk, testing her patience in general, just acting a fool. But she didn't rise from her seat, she stayed calm, she stayed cool, didn't raise her heart one beat, didn't raise her voice one octave, didn't raise her hand to me. Instead, she said as still as could be, then lifted her left index finger to, to slightly parted lips and said this, Shh. so softly your ears could almost deny it. But it spoke volumes so loud the whole room fell silent, the whole room squared their shoulders, the whole room sat up straight, and though I never told it was she who helped me make the subtle connection between silence and strength. Because my dad told me this, you don't have to worry about the man loudly beating his gums, but keep your eye on the man quietly loading his gun. So silently I went home, I hugged, kissed my mom, and continued my journey on toward manhood. And now as an adult, I often wish man would follow her example, heed her advice. I mean, just the other night, down in College Park, as dusk was turning dark, I'd heard word of a man who'd been beating his wife. After they'd both been out cheating, and now the one was in the right, and now she ain't fighting out of spite, she fighting for her life. And we all know that men's egos bruise so light, I mean, we all know this. But the only way he could think to express it was with the closed fist, and I wish just before he had thrown the first blow. Just before the argument had gotten out of control, just before the first seed of infidelity was sold, they could have both felt that librarian speaking to their soul, saying, be quiet. Square your shoulders and go about the business of being a responsible woman and man, a, a loving wife and husband is bigger than you, you understand. You got kids to raise up, so put down your raised hand and just shh. And I can't help but think of Iraq and Iran, Afghanistan, Syria, North Korea, Pakistan, the Bible, the Quran, Bush, Saddam, the passion of Prime Minister Sharon, Bin Laden, the sands, the towers, the bombs, and I want to stand a librarian on the White House lawn. I want to stand a librarian on the UN floor, stand a librarian on the shores where the troops deploy, stand a librarian firmly on foreign and domestic soils when those good old boys get there arguing about the price of crude oil per barrel, about what's due Caesar and what's due Pharaoh in a world so wide when views get so narrow and they start reaching for their arrows, bows and guns, reaching for your support, your, your funds and sons. I want the voice of a librarian to come through clear to tell these politicians to stand up straight, be of good faith and good cheer, play nice and get along because we're going to all have to live here. And she could say all of this not by raising her voice, not by raising her fists, but by raising her left index finger to slightly parted lips and saying, shh. Thank you all so much.